welcome everyone um, to our EFB webinar um, about how green roofs can support the EU biodiversity strategy. Um, I will start with the introduction. Um, we have here today Dusty um, Ketch, uh, our um, president of the European Federation for Greening Buildings. Um, he's 20 years of designing and developing approach to the to deliver biodiversity in ex uh, on extensive green roofs, um, including provision for rare birds and uh, invertebrate species, and uh, creating innovative wetland habitats at roof level. Um, he's, uh, he set up the second major study on biodiversity and green roofs in 2002 in London. He is also yeah, um, a co-founder of the uh, UK um, Green Roof um, Organization Grow. Um, and I also welcome and want to introduce you Peter um, Desensky. Um, he's a, a board member of the EFB and um, managing the, um, the, the Deep Forest um, Landscape and Green Roof Company in uh, Budapest. And his uh, special, uh, his special, um, specialty um, is spiders, green roofs, and applied nature-based solution in urban areas. And he's he's designing and building, and teaching green roofs for now twenty years. And to my person, um, I'm a project manager at the research and innovation lab at uh, uh, in in Vienna. Um, and I'm working also for the EFB as uh, the general secretary. Um, what you can expect from the, what will you expect from the webinar? Um, I will shortly introduce who the EFB is, um, who we are, and then Dusty will uh, talk about the delivering for natural capital and biodiversity on green roofs. Uh, followed by Peter, um, he is presenting um, biodiverse uh, roofs from Budapest. And then we have a Q&A session at the end. Yeah, welcome everyone. And I want to introduce you uh, uh, shortly about the EFB, the European Federation of Green Roofs and uh, Wall Association. It was founded in 1979. Um, as a non-for-profit organization, is is an umbrella and it's an umbrella organization for all national associations within Europe. We have now um, 15 national associations as a member, and we are working also with the um, other networks like the World Green Infrastructure Network, Elka, IFLA, So Green, and so on. It's um, here is an overview about all the 15 members, which are um, their the, their members are um, green roof and wall suppliers, manufacturers, and contractors, and we are also um, having planners and architects and uh, cities as um, national members and working with universities and research institutions. So um, I would like to hand over the word now to Dusty. Thank you. And Mike. you will get the power of moving the presentation. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Dusty Gedge. Um, and uh, I've been involved in Green Roofs for over 25 years, particularly in terms of delivering biodiversity. And so what I'm gonna try and do in this first presentation is give an overview of my experience but also some of the basic principles of delivering biodiversity at green roof level and um i'm going to start off with a little prologue um as we would say this is a is a bird species called the linnet and um the linnet was once a very very common bird in our countryside and uh, across europe and in the united kingdom it has declined over the last well, actually the last 50 years, um, and quite significantly. And I live in London, and 
you can see from the 1970s, it, it started to collapse. And I live in London and about three, four years before um, this picture was taken, I got very involved in gr delivering green roos for, for a, another bird species. And this is Greenwich Peninsula. Um, it's actually, um, I've tipped it up so it fits in. And, and at that time, there were about seven to 10 pairs of linnets on the Greenwich Peninsula. And there was one green roof, a tiny green roof, actually, on the side of this uh, supermarket. And um, in 1999, it was um, declared the most sustainable retail store in the world. And that's the prologue, because I'm going to come back to the linnet and that, not that store, another store um, at the end. Uh, oh, sorry, there is the store. <laughs> that's Ikea in 2019, which is on the same site. So... What I'm going to talk about is a little bit about intensive green roofs, but that's not the main focus of delivering biodiversity. But I'm going to get into the, the details of extensive green roofs. And there's different types. Um, I come from a UK background. We use a lot of wildflower turf. I know they use a lot of wildlife, wildflower turf, in, uh, particularly in the Netherlands. Um, I think also in Poland. Um, it's not so common practice in the German-speaking countries. and we have sedum roos and we have what is defined in our UK code of practice as biodiverse green roofs. And that is the, the main basic principles of extensive green roofs come from research in the late 1990s and early noughties in Switzerland, which I went and made contact with uh, the researchers there, Dr. Stefan Benison, and brought those ideas back to, to London. And it's actually the basis of most of the planning that goes on in the Greater London Authority area. And I'm going to look at some other approaches, which in terms of wetlands and how solar can augment biodiversity. And I'll come back to IKEA Green Greenwich as an example. If, so, if there are any questions, please use the question chat. Um, so uh, you, you don't forget about it. So on the left side, you can use the question chat. Thanks. Yeah, what we do is also Peter possibly can answer those questions as I'm talking, and when Peter's talking, I can help answer that, and then we we get we we'll answer ones that we haven't covered in the open question session um, at the end. So to get the basis, we have what is known as intensive green roofs, semi-intensive green roofs, and they they're like parks and gardens at roof level. And then we have biodiverse extensive green roofs and sedum extensive green roofs. And there's some other varieties um, of the extensive that I'll mention later. But that, that's the general principle. Uh, of, they're the general types of green roofs that we have. And this is an intensive green roof in Paris. Um, it's a very interesting one. It's a community centre now in the 23rd of Rondismont. And it has lots of different treatments. It has Mediterranean gardens, food growing, it has small orchards. And inherently, that is bringing biodiversity into the city. And we also have these very high-end um, um, rooftop gardens um, that are actually particularly good for common and garden bird species. And this, this happens to be in the centre of London. And where staff can sit out, and I actually monitor this roof, and there's some very, very interesting bees uh, and wasps that are found on this roof, which is right in the heart of London. And if you were in London, this is the densest area of green roofs in the whole of London, right in the city of London, what we call the city of London. And they tend to be very, very formal spaces. You can see here there's lots of hedges and lots of lawns and, and actually very, very little um, native vegetation. And one of the basic principles um, that I'm certainly pushing in terms of UK and uh, in the UK in terms of biodiversity net gain is a process that was set up by Karlsruhe nearly, I think it was actually uh, 30 years ago in their planning documents about how rooftop gardens should actually be designed. And that was landscape architects should be looking at 50% native species and 50% non-native of known wildlife value. And it was part of what is known as the Karlsruhe model. Um, it's still existent in existence, as I do believe. And also another thing is that a green roof 
to be considered a green roof needs to be 70% soil and vegetation, which also includes water features, which again, bring inherent biodiversity value and um, only 30% hard standing. And that's, that's, a, that's a good principle if you're designing um, rooftop gardens, intensive green roofs. But inherently intensive green roofs, they bring wildlife to the city. But the, the important thing in terms of delivering biodiversity at an EU strategy level is actually the extensive green roofs. And here we have a variety of green roofs. Um, these are all pictures from the United Kingdom, except for the one in the bottom corner where we have these orchids. And there's a number of roofs across Switzerland which have fantastic uh, orchid populations. Um, there's the Volishofen, um, moose treatment plant, which has 16 species of orchids, which are very, very rare within um, the Zurich Canton. So there are things that we can do, and, and they're particular roofs that are designed or were accidentally designed in a particular way. But the traditional conventional extensive green roofs are where we can actually potentially make a real difference to biodiversity across the EU and in the UK, and also in European, other European countries which aren't part of the EU. And I'm just going to go over the, the main systems that are used. This is a Sedum extensive green roof. It's lightweight. In terms of our codes of practice, it wouldn't be compliant because it's um, um, only got, it's only 40, mil in, 40 millimeters in thickness, it's ultra thin. But the key thing is that I use to assess whether a green roof has any, um, is inherently good for biodiversity, is below that. It's got limited species diversity, and that means it has limited diversity of fauna, and it's low maintenance, and it's got no topographical variety. When you get a sedum extensive green roof, which is compliant, this is a very, very healthy one on, on the IKEA in Greenwich, um, it is thin, it's 60 millimetres um, with a seed and blanket on top of it, actually, which makes it 80 millimetres. And we have limited species diversity. There's about 16 species of sedums. And then there's some species that will colonise. Um, either they were in the blanket or they will come from the surrounding um, environment. They will volunteer, as the Americans say. But it's got a very, very healthy sedum community because it's got good substrate beneath it. And that increases the diversity of fauna compared to the thin sealant blanket, and it's still low maintenance. However, the biodiverse green roof is where we get into how we can design extensive green roofs to actually maximize the benefit for biodiversity. We've got different substrates. We've got different substrate depths. We've got higher species, diversity in terms of wildflowers and sedums, higher fauna diversity because of that process, and once it's established, they're very low maintenance. And, oh, I don't know what's happening here. That's all gone blue for me. Uh, in the United Kingdom and elsewhere, we also use wildflower turf, which is uh, good from an architect's point of view because you get this instant wildflower meadow. But again, here, you know, you've got no structural variety. You've got very good species diversity and good diversity of fauna but not quite as good diversity of fauna if you had that structural diversity. And it's relatively high maintenance because they need to be irrigated, even a maritime climate like the United Kingdom. So the basic principles of delivering biodiversity on extensive green roofs are um, actually summarized in this document, which is online, which is a summary of the research that I set up in uh, the United Kingdom back in 2002. Uh, which went on for seven years, and also is um, a review of the research prior to that in Switzerland, and, and the results were the same. And Switzerland's climate is relatively similar to the United Kingdom's. And what is interesting about Peter talking after me is once you're in a middle Europe climate, um, it's slightly different, and that's where Peter's work is, is quite interesting. But you'll get a link to this, we'll send you a link to this, and essentially what it lays out is that we need topographical variety. We need it seeded with native wildflowers associated with dry grasslands. And you add additional features such as dead wood, particularly hard dead wood, uh, which can be used by invertebrates to nest in. 
rubble mounds which provide micro habitats for uh, especially moisture which is, allows very moisture sensitive wildflowers like um, linaria vulgare to grow and you know it's laid out there so you can the reason for that is spiders the, di the, the greater diversity of spiders on an intensive green roof is implicit that there's a greater diversity of invertebrates because spiders are like the tigers of the grassland. And, and that is the basic principle that um, Dr. Stefan Bernison and Dr. Ginger Vakadash in the United Kingdom um, uh, worked out through their studies. And when you get this topographical variety, you get um, deep substrate where you get tall vegetation, you get web spiders, where you get um, uh, thin um, substrate, you get wolf spiders. And I'm not going to go into the details of the species, but that's the principle. And this is Ikea in Greenwich. And what you've got here is you can see these rubble mounds that adds uh, an extra substrate, but also the rubble mounds uh, in between the, the rocks, uh, particularly in periods of high drought, you get moisture that stays and it allows the plants to survive the long periods of heat that we are experiencing in London and certainly cities all over uh, Europe are experiencing too. And to put it in an ecological context, and I noticed there's somebody from the Czech and uh, this was given to my uh, Pavel Dostal, who's also on the talk, because there's a lot of interest in brownfield land in the Czech and across Europe, is in the UK, we define this land as open mosaic habitat. And it's actually in a UK context, a context where some of the best invertebrate assemblages, as we call them, are found. And a green roof designed for biodiversity is essentially an open mosaic habitat. And this is a picture of um, some post-industrial land um, in um, actually in Glasgow. And this is a, a green roof designed way back in 1999, which reflects that open mosaic habitat, but it also reflects a very important habitat in, in alpine countries, such as Switzerland, as this is in Zurich, which is dry riverbeds. Um, the Rhine is being boarded up in Switzerland and dry riverbeds have a very, very specific community, which is very, very simpler, si similar to open mosaic habitats. It was also designed for a lizard, this roof, which was uh, present on the site before it was turned into um, these uh, extra platforms at the Hop Barnhof Zurich. And for me, what I do in London is try and reflect habitats that are in the wider countryside um, that are similar to green roofs. And vegetated shingle or shell banks, as this is a shell bank not far from London, it's about 30 miles from London. And when you look at the detail of the actual vegetation at ground level, it's very, very similar to uh, an extensive green roof designed for biodiversity. This has two species of sedum naturally, sedum album, sedum acra. And also you can see Echium vulgare there, which is a very, very, uh, is very numerous on biodiverse green roofs in London. I actually collect seeds from this site and spread them on roofs in London. Um, also, this is a very species rich calcareous habitat. So all over Europe, we have calcareous grasslands. Um, I know Peter's talking and Peter knows I know Hungary well. We have the Agatelect and we have the Zemplin Hills. They're all calcareous. And this particular photograph is taken at the top of the slope where there's very, very little soil. And it's actually very, very similar to what a good extensive green roof designed for biodiversity can be. So we get this mixture of um, floral communities on extensive green roofs that are similar to very dry, rich, calcareous grassland and vegetated shingle and you know, dry riverbeds in Switzerland. So the idea of biodiverse green roofs is to replicate um, dry, um, dry species rich grassland types. And, and it's just a very simple process. And if you spent time on a good green roof design for biodiversity anywhere in Europe, you would find communities like that at actually ground level. They're dry, they're very stressed, but they are very, very important for invertebrates. There's a couple of other processes um, by a solar green roofs, and you can find we have a we have an online course which hopefully will be available on video, 
which we did a few months ago. But when you combine solar with green roofs, you also actually help create the topographical variety. You actually create shade. So I was talking about biosolar roofs, and I sh what I want to show you is that actually this is a north-south array. What happens when you design biosolar green roofs, which are technically roofs which are designed for biodiversity and solar panels, the wind shade at the rear, if you have slightly deeper substrate, you get this very, very diverse floral community. And the yellow plant there is, is a very important plant for a very rare butterfly in the United Kingdom, and it's actually rare elsewhere across Europe. And it's called the small blue. And by creating this wind shade, you create a moisture area where certain plant species can flourish, which then augment it for uh, invertebrates. And I wanted to talk about biodiversity and wetlands, which can link to stormwater control. I'm currently writing blue roof guidance in the United Kingdom on, on, on blue roofs. And this is one in Switzerland, which was done way back in 2002. And we took these ideas to the UK, and I know my Swedish colleagues have taken these, and you can create these what we call ephemeral wet ponds. And it's relatively easy to do. It's called damming water on the roof. And um, it's relatively simple to do, but you, you kind of need to know what you do. But by doing that, we can augment the biodiversity value uh, of, of a green roof. So I'm now back at IKEA. You can see here it's got these different roof treatments. Um, this is a ceiling blanket, which I've already discussed. We got some food growing. And what's interesting about the food growing areas uh, is that the linnets that I referred to in my prologue actually nested in the apple trees. And then you've got this formal area. And then you've got this wildflower blanket, which has to be irrigated. And if the irrigation is turned off, it actually dies. And what we're trying to do is now actually let it die so that actually we can seed it with plants that actually want to be on this roof. And then we have at the end, um, no, sorry, this is the wildflower turf where we added some uh, rubble mounds. And what we found in the two droughts that we had the last two years is the, the plants survived in the rubble mounds better than they did on the quite high nutrient wildflower turfs. And that has augmented uh, the biodiversity of this part, particular part of the system. Back 20 years ago, my first roof had nothing on it. We seeded it and slowly as we seed it, and these are all plants that I've collected around um, Southeast London and uh, the neighboring countryside. It starts to actually get this very, very diverse native wildflower community with sedums as well. And sedums are an important part of this process because they help support the wildflowers during the hot periods. Yeah. So there it is, there's the roof. Um, I've seeded this with uh, native wildflowers, and we have a process to try and create a native wildflower mix for London going on in the city. And what I said to you earlier is that there's also sedums as part of this because they help support the wildflowers during the dry period. That's a box of seeds. Uh, I spent my life the last 20 years collecting seeds and throwing them on green roofs. And my epilogue is the linnet because the linnet is this bird that has declined significantly. And the Greenwich Peninsula has been now extensively built on. So in a way, this is kind of where Peter was. You know, here we are, I've got just bare substrate and its seeds. And actually, you can see some kidney vetch. Actually, it's covered in kidney vetch because I collected kidney vetch. Um, I can't remember its Latin name. So next slide, Elizabeth, if you can move the slides. I don't know if you can. Great. And this is actually three years on. There's probably, I, I count because I collect the seeds, uh, there's probably 60 different species of plants on here. And there's, there's a couple of non-natives um, on there too, which were planted by the contractor. And the point now, we've had two or three, this year has been particularly good, but uh, 2018 late, 2019 late, and 2020 early, we have really significant droughts. And this roof of all the roofs is the one that stayed the greenest because as Peter has said, the plants are creating um, the support system during the periods of heat. Next slide, please, um, Elizabeth. There's my picture of my seeds. I've, I've got five boxes, which will be going on IKEA this year. And my long-term plan is that we use um, IKEA and other roofs that we use the seed mixes to eventually have a seed mix that we can seed 
roofs in London um, generically. Next slide. So my epilogue, if you remember my story about the linnet, the linnet has collapsed. This is Ikea. Uh, all summer I've been filming linnets on this roof. Next slide, please. And from a biodiversity context, this is, you may have forgotten the slide earlier, um, Greenwich Peninsula 20 years ago was selected to be covered in housing. There are now more linnets on the Greenwich Peninsula now probably than they were 20 years ago. Next slide, if you can, because where all the yellow circles are, are all green roofs that have been designed for biodiversity. And that is the effect of policy at London level, which I and Mark Harris is on the call, we, we helped make. And there are now still another 20 different blocks to go in. So from a species that has declined in Europe, which was hanging on on Greenwich Peninsula, they're actually increasing on the Greenwich Peninsula because of the green roofs that have been installed there. How did you finance those projects in the past? How do you get building owners to finance such projects? Yeah, actually, this is my presentation is all about. Okay. Uh, um, but I can tell you in briefly that uh, every case when we built a, a biodiverse green roof, uh, we managed to convince the customer to upgrade from a sealum green roof, uh, a regular extensive green roof to a biodiverse green roof. And the, the sales arguments are A, is that uh, they will uh, get at the same price a higher biological activity, biodiversity. Uh, or B, uh, they, will, they will have other benefits uh, uh, at a little bit of a higher price. And they also had projects where a biodiverse approach proved to be cheaper than uh, a regular approach, uh, in, especially in terms of maintenance on a long term, where actually the customer uh, managed to gain some savings in costs. In London, um, we actually have regulations that, you know, where the, the planning authorities require a biodiverse green roof so that becomes part of policy and it's the same in um, certain cities in switzerland particularly the german-speaking cities but i do believe that lausanne and geneva have that process too so that comes down to having good planning and, uh, and and good process and i believe paris has has some regulation like that but certainly the driver for biodiverse green roofs has been through policy in London. Can you move your slides now, Peter? I'm going to talk about three projects which we did in Hungary. Uh, uh, we, we are Deep Forest, the, the largest green roof building company or contractors in Hungary. For 20 years, we are building green roofs and actually the three projects are linked. One of them is not a green roof, but there is a reason um, uh, why I show it, because the first one will be our very first biodiverse green roof, which uh, in parts failed. Uh, and the second project where we learned a lot of things from a project, and the third project where, where we applied uh, it on the right way. And this is so far our biggest and, and best uh, biodiverse green roof project. Um, so it's always about low budget and uh, and uh, uh, everybody expects direct savings and um, or a higher e ecological value for the same price so these are the the basically the key sa sales arguments we are using uh, in the process when we work with multinational companies uh, it's very important that we always find a kind of a green ambassador in the in the organization, a manager who really likes the idea and who helps us convince the entire organization. And then it's very challenging also to maintain the level of commitment. And we always have to offer tangible benefits for them because this is how multi multinationals think and how they uh, how they uh, uh, 
act. Let's talk about Hungary a little bit. Uh, we have a very extreme continental climate and it's very challenging uh, when we build extensive green roofs. Uh, and our continental climate is can be very dry and hot in summertime. Uh, we have about 500 millimeters of, of, uh, of rain water throughout the year, but in summertime we can have six or eight weeks we, we, without a drop of rain. And uh, also wintertime can be very, very cold, uh, down to minus 10, 15, sometimes minus 20. Uh, so this is a picture uh, of a regular uh, ordinary sedum green roof. And usually the, you don't irrigate sedum, but this is what we do in the, in the establishment period for a year. Uh, because if we don't irrigate sedum for a year, it takes five or six years sometimes to, to get 100% or 90% coverage of the seed. And when we irrigate it for a year, then it looks like this, and then you can leave it alone, and then you have a nice uh, sedum blanket. But in biodiverse green groups, uh, supplementary water supply is not always uh, a very good idea. And there are other challenges. We can go on. This is a, a, a very bad quality um, uh, substrate. It's not a substrate, actually. It's a very bad quality soil, which was put on a green roof by our competition. You can see it's, it's basically clay. And then we have a lot of weeds in a few weeks. You can see also the little sedum uh, plants. But, but when you use regular soil, uh, it's awful uh, and the sedum does not have a chance uh, to thrive. So the three projects are, the first one is, uh, it's a beautiful office building in Budapest. It's called the Greenhouse Offices, actually. It's a project by Skanska. And we have built, we designed and built three different green roofs on that project. One of them is an extensive biodiverse green roof on the seventh floor. And um, here, originally, they wanted to make a, a regular sedum extensive green roof, but we managed to, to convince uh, Skanska to upgrade it at the same price to biodiverse green roof. Next one, please. So here are the key, the basics uh, of, of biodiverse green roofs. Already Dusty talked about it. Uh, we always re refer to heterogeneity because what you want to create is a, is a microhabitat. So you have to create different niches for different species uh, so have, to, have, uh, to reach uh, a high biodiversity. And uh, topography is one of the keys. Maybe you can see it on a picture. Actually, it's not from our project. This is a, a picture from England. I just use it to show you all these basics so you can see a little bit of a topography um, here also um, uh, the different types of substrates different quality the organic content is varying this is what we apply here we use a lot of shelters a lot of dead wood uh, and stones pebbles etc and we always use mixed propagation methods which i will talk about a little bit more and sometimes we also do we call it breeding spots, so on the spot we, we use a little bit of an irrigated area. So on this project we have, on this project we had multiple green roofs. Uh, in the garden what you can see is an intensive green roof on the garret ceiling. Uh, next to it, on the next picture there's a better, the next slide a better picture. It's a uh, it's another biodiverse green roof, a different, uh, a, um, a competitive strategy, um, ecological approach, biodiverse green roof on the top of the canteen with some shrubs and with 40 centimeters of substrate depth and irrigation. So this is the seventh floor where this is a very narrow, um, approximately eight, 10 centimeters of substrate and a large, 1200 square meter extensive biodiverse green roof. And we have great variety of plants. We, we use different uh, seeds, uh, young plants, uh, sedum cuts, 
uh, so different propagation methods. And sometimes it does look so beautiful like a Hollywood flower meadow when we have uh, some uh, rain and, and a nice springtime. And in the next picture, you can see the reality, the Hungarian pusta, when it's really, really yellow and brown. And it, it's, if you are not uh, um, a gardener or horticulturist and an ecologist, it, it may look a little bit depressing. And, and let's stay here on this picture a little bit, Elizabeth. So this is a very expensive office area next to it. And the story is that you can see the micro irrigation sprinklers, which we applied for the beginning uh, to help the vegetation to grow, the seeds and, and the young plants. And of course, they loved it. And, and everything was beautiful until we turned off the water. And then in the first summertime, it looked like this. And uh, the customers uh, of this floor were very unhappy. I had a lot of problems and, uh, and, and, and we learned a lot of lessons from that. You need to have commitment not only from the investor, but also from the ones who will use, who will have the view uh, from this uh, biodiverse uh, green roof. And what we, we made a big mistake that in the establishment period, we used a lot of water. We overwatered, over irrigated the whole area. So there was a contra selection, a bad contra selection of the plants because basically we supported the plants uh, which need a lot of which need a lot of water, uh, and um, and also sometimes we used a very high organic content in the substrate. So this uh, uh, extensive. Uh, biodiverse green roof did not really act like an extensive one. Uh, so this is something which we, where we failed in our first project. Next one, please. And then we had a large uh, project at actually the largest Lego factory where we built uh, a 100 hectare uh, green area around the Lego factory and 30 hectares of this area were basically outside of the plant and uh, of the factory and uh, uh, they just designed or, or, or wanted to make here a regular grassland with uh, extensive uh, lawn technology, mowing it 10 times a year, etc. And then we uh, suggested or recommended to have a habitat restoration uh, instead. And if you, if you can come back to one slide, Bill, uh, and uh, the idea behind this is a lot of cost savings at the first place, because when you have a regular uh, loan, you really have to mow it eight, ten times a year in Hungary, even when you don't irrigate it. Uh, so it's a lot of costs. And, um, and, and when you have uh, a well-established uh, natural habitat restoration, uh, like here, this mosaic step uh, with oak woods, uh, then after three or four years, uh, basically, you have to mow it or you just have to have some, some cattle or animals uh, and, and then you don't have any uh, maintenance costs. So basically here, the financial benefits, that was the key sales argument. Next one, please. This is the areas where we uh, got the green light to have a habitat restoration. Next one, please. And this is uh, a very interesting picture. This is rye next to the Lego factory. And yes, go on, please. And we used rye on purpose as a nursing plant. Because on 30 hectares, uh, you cannot really irrigate your uh, native uh, plant seeds, your target uh, species. But because this is really uh, the, the south, east, south part of Hungary, which is very dry, you have to somehow still support or foster your target vegetation. 
And this is a very common ecological method, as I learned it here, using nursing plants. And rye is, is great because it works for one or two years and it gives some kind of shelter um, for the target vegetation. It's a better uh, rainwater control, water management, uh, weed control, etc. And after two years, you can see that our target vegetation is really thriving here. The rye is gone. You can use different uh, plants as nursing plants, lucerne rye, uh, and you will see a lot of different examples later on. Yes, we also used different propagation methods. Go on, please. Uh, here's some grass seeds, native plants, native species. And we also use a lot of hay, which we got from uh, natural areas in the surroundings. And the hay is protection and propagation at the same time, because the hay contains uh, a lot of target species as well. It also protects the, uh, the grass seeds. You can see the grass is really growing from the hay or under, from under the hay. And this is how it looked after three years. And you are an ecologist or an enthusiast, it's beautiful. And also we had some students participating, etc. Let's go on. And we also have an IKEA with a green roof in Budapest. And actually it, it, it has a, a green roof for 20 years now. And it used to be a sedum green roof, an extended green roof. Next one, please. That was the original vegetation. There were some trees and other plants in plantainers. And the pro problem was that uh, the waterproof needed renovation in 2014. So we re really had to remove everything from the roof on 6,500 square meters. Uh, by hand labor without any machines. Uh, and also we had to remove the substrate and we had to replace the original waterproof, pro, uh, waterproofing uh, and, and heat insulation. So we had to really build up uh, a, a different uh, roof basically. And when we finished with the waterproofing after one year, uh, we realized that all the sedums basically gone from, from the substrate. We still had the original substrate. And then we decided to, to talk to IKEA to have a biodiverse green roof. Because at the time being, it seemed to be uh, easier to make than a, a, a sedum green roof again. And then this time you can see a lot of uh, nursing plants. We used kidney wedge, uh, onobrichis and, and different uh, nursing plants instead of watering the target vegetation. We had different seeds. You can buy also seeds from, from companies like OptiGreen, uh, Hauenstein, uh, also in Hungary, we collected a lot of seeds. There's a great uh, selection of seeds available on the market in Europe. And also we use a lot of sedum cuts and uh, sedum is essential on these kind of projects because in the, in the shallowest parts, they really working very well. This is the second year. And mainly thanks to the nursing plants, after one and a half years, we had that kind of coverage, which is incredible in Hungary uh, in our dry climate. Basically, it's close to 100. And we have a great var variety of, of species and biodiversity throughout the year. Already two, two years later, we counted with our ecologists uh, more than 130 species uh, throughout the season. We have really very, very dense biodiver hotspots, uh, a great fauna, a lot of spiders probably, which we never examined. Uh, yeah, we have a neighborhood who is always uh, watching and looking. And, and in the beginning, they thought that there's a lot of weed on the roof of IKEA. So they started to, to call IKEA. 
Uh, so we had to make um, a kind of um, information board uh, on the roof, uh, very similar to, to this one in another park in Budapest, which, was, which is a very similar technology. Yes, we have a great wildlife now and, and the roof of Ica, which attracts a lot of bumblebees. Also, on the next picture, you can see ecologists regularly visit uh, this I wonder. So here are the conclusions. Uh, the lessons we learn now, we are, we made over about eight or nine biodiverse green roofs in Budapest and we apply these, uh, these basic rules in our climate, which is again very extreme. The next picture is made, this is the last picture, actually I made a mistake. We have more than 200 species already. We, we counted again this year. And this is a picture from this June. And this is a, an incredibly beautiful green roof now. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I make a, a comment? I don't know how much time we have left, but I think what's very interesting because you weren't quite clear about the connection between the ground level and the roof level. And okay. obviously I know your work, Peter. And what was interesting about that is the lessons that Peter learned at ground level, you took to when you did the Ikea, you didn't go for high nutrients and irrigation. You went for using the, the nursery plants to build up the diversity. And the other lesson that on the original roof is, and I think this is very, very important when we talk about biodiversity on green roofs, is there's a tendency, particularly from designers' point of view, is to get everything looking really good quickly. And they use too much nutrients and they don't allow the plants to work out where the plants want to be. And certainly my work and what i'm now doing it just so happens they happen to be two ikeas is the roof that was not seeded and was left to self-colonize i've been allowed to seed that roof and some of the fodder plants that peter's mentioned i have hand collected and spread on the roof and slowly but surely that roof is building its own resilience and what's really interesting, the staff have access to that roof, the roof at the end, which was furthest away from the public because the designers thought it was going to look the ugliest. And the staff all go to me, this roof is the beautiful roof. And I tell them in seven years time, that roof will be the best green roof in London. Because of that time, and in a way, I've used the same sort of provocation techniques, not as technically as Peter, because he's a horticulturalist. I'm just a, a man who throws seeds and sees what happens. But I think there's a lesson to learn there, Peter, isn't there? The impatience. I'm handing to you now, Peter. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I, I am a, um, a landscape contractor, one of the, the largest landscape contractors in Budapest. And we have built in the last 20 years the, a, a huge amount of intensive landscapes, gardens, uh, office uh, around uh, a, a category office buildings, uh, um, I don't know, very high quality uh, places. And it's all about irrigation, high quality standards and, and very much controlled everything, a lot of nutrients, uh, intensive maintenance. And really, you have to think very opposite when you when you create biodiverse green roofs or on ground level in the city, which we also do now, uh, biodiverse uh, or, or natural grass areas. And and in Hungary, the only way is to mimic that kind of uh, dry grasslands, uh, these these calcareous grasslands which you mentioned, Dusty. Uh, uh, the, the way they manage nutrients, the way they manage water, uh, uh, the, the structure of their soil, soil 
uh, and and all the ecological processes there. And and as a again as a as a landscape contractor, a horticulturist, I really had to drastically change uh, uh, the point of view, the the the, the mindsets of of my entire company and, and mine, and and also the customers have to be really uh, open-minded and and uh, and and enthusiastic about these projects, and and uh, otherwise it, it's not going to work. Um... The best best approach to put vegetation on a roof um, is it planting or letting seeds come naturally? I would say, if I may, and then you can you can um, compliment me or or not, Peter. My original approach twenty three years ago was based upon the idea is that you put a substrate up and you let the plants come. When you do that on a green roof, you get the plants that you don't want on a green roof. In in many cities. In our part of the world, even in France, you'll get buddleia, which is actually a, can be very, very harmful to a roof. And what I immediately learned in 2000 when I went to meet Dr. Stefan Brunison, where he had changed processes in Switzerland, where they didn't seed, he said you have to seed as soon as you can. So seeding, what we do in the UK is seed and plant what we call plug plants, which are... Um, um, partially grown plants but uh, I'm going to have a hand to Peter because I think this idea of using nursery plants for biodiverse green roofs is a very good idea and you use a lot of what we call vetches, pea family and they are the, the plants you also want on a green roof because they're very very good for particularly for long tongued bumblebees over to you Peter yes uh, you, you, I think the, 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 the thing the, the, the main thing is that you have to understand the the basic ecology of of this uh, of the green roofs, and I believe you may go uh, on the roots not seeding anything, but then you really have to uh, work with zero organic content in the beginning. Uh, but I would also suggest to go with nursing plants. Uh, and I, what I did not mention in my presentation, that we originally just uh, put on iCare about 50 different species. And now, now the three-fourths of the species which we counted this year has come from the surrounding, by birds, by winds, etc. So nature will take over anyway. In the beginning, you give a kind of direction with the, with the substrate you use. Uh, the nursing plants and and with with some uh, seed mixes. Also, there are seed mixes already in Hungary available, partially uh, with partially nursing plants. So so it, it, this this whole market is really developing, be not because of the green roofs only, but because in cities these nature areas, these nature grass areas, really developing everywhere in the, in the world. Yeah, so I, I'll just come on to the nutrient thing because of, often um, the idea for a lot of people is, you know, to make plants grow, you put lots of nutrients in them. And in a stressful environment like a green roof, it's the opposite. You put as little nutrients as possible. And, you know, you always, my view is, and I differ slightly from Peter, we, you always need between 10 and 10 to 20 percent organic. But actually, if you go to those, what I mentioned, those vegetative shingles or those really species rich calcareous grasslands, which we have all over Europe. Where it's really species rich, it's what the Americans would call, call short grass prairie, which has virtually no organic content. And actually, those species rich, rich environments don't have a lot of grass they have a lot of wild flowers there is grass there but there's not a lot and certainly in a uk context and i i suspect in a french context I'm, I'm not too sure elsewhere when we talk about calcareous grassland we think of that as 80 percent grass and 20 percent wild flowers but a species rich um calcareous grassland is actually 90 percent wild flowers and 10% grass. And I'm actually thinking, Peter, some of the pushed down um, 
south of Apai that I know because you know that I know Hungary. You know, it's very, very wildflower rich. It has yes. grass, but it's not grass rich. And that's sometimes where ecologists mess up because they're, they're reflecting what grassland is. It's 80% grass. And you go, you don't want grass on a green roof. Let the grass come. Do you agree, Peter? Yes. So, so I, I did not talk about it, but again, the basic ecology is that you have stress tolerant plants. Uh, those plants, those species who can deal with the lack of something elementary, like the lack of water, the, the short supply of water or the lack of nutrients or the lack uh, or the low organic content. These are stress tolerant plants. And you have the other part, the competitive plants, the competitive species, which, uh, which are very aggressive, very dominant. And when you have water, sunlight, nutrients, high organic content, this is regular gra grass species. They, do they dominate everything. And then you have a very low biodiversity. This is why on a dry grassland, on a calcareous uh, grassland on a shallow uh, uh, soil, you have uh, a multiple higher level of biodiversity uh, and, and number of species than on a wet grassland where you have a few dominant species. And this is what you try to avoid on a green roof on a long term, because when you make the circumstances for competitive grass species, uh, then you will not have biodiversity and you will have uh, an ugly green roof on a long term. Also, then you have a lot of problems uh, with with wheat, etc. So uh, the keys are the very low organic content, uh, very low nutrient level and uh, and uh, it, no irrigation at all, at least in Hungary. Obviously, it's different in ocean uh, uh, England and, and next to the ocean and, and the seas. Well, if I may, Peter, um, um, what was I going to say is it's interesting you say, you know, because I do know Hungary and I know middle Europe, it, it, the fact that Peter is not necessarily irrigating roofs in Hungary is, is, is very surprising. I'm very anti uh, irrigation on extensive biodiverse green roofs in the United Kingdom. And one of the reasons is, and I know that some of my suppliers don't like this is, and I, if you've got a wildflower turf and you have to irrigate it, you're training the plants to rely upon water. If you create a biodiverse green roof from seed, what plant, um, I think Peter, when he says nursery plants, he means like plug plants. And from uh, those having those nursery um species in there you're letting the the plants that understand stress adapt to the stress of the green roof and this is sometimes the problem about impatience but if you want to create biodiverse green roofs you start with seed planting plants and using those nursery plants so you get the diversity and the resilience and let's be quite frank in September, most natural habitats in the whole of Europe are turning brown. Because that's what natural habitats do. Over to you, Peter. Yes, in Hungary, it's starting in July. So <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it starts in London in July, actually, as well. But um... Yeah, but the rich Hungarian office workers do not want to see the pusta in Budapest on a green roof. So <laughs> this is also another another thing. Yeah, but uh, the point there, Peter, what you did in the mistake on the first one was because you irrigated it a lot and you used a lot of nutrients, you yes. kind of made the plants grow really, really fast. And then when the heat came, they just collapsed. What you did yes. on the IKEA is almost train the plants to be how they the plants want to be. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We just let the, the toughest one survive. And then, uh, it, then it um, just... I'm just looking at all the other questions. I just know, I know there's one from Julian in Spain. Uh, we are interested to know about the experience of invasive alien species impact on biodiversity loss. What is the criteria to define native and non-native species? Well, uh, 
I don't really want to go there, Julian, but in the context in terms of intensive green roofs, it, depending on your national legislation, you wouldn't be able to use an invasive non-native species in the horticultural trade in the United Kingdom if it's listed. But my context for an intensive green roof is that where you use non-native, you should really be using native non-native plants, which are of known wildlife value. And we're fortunate in the United Kingdom, uh, the Royal Horticultural Society have a list of um, plants that are of known value to wildlife. So bamboo, bamboo, which you should never put on a roof anyway, has no value for wildlife. Um, really, it's not for us to define what's native and non-native. That's for the authorities. Um, I will add this. Um, occasionally, we have some naturalized species, um, which is like purple toe flex, which is not a native. It's become naturalized, which is Linaria purperia. It's quite common on continental Europe. I don't have a problem with that on a green roof because it's very, very good on a green roof. And it's very, very good for a couple of very, very specific rare uh, moths, actually. So there's a balance there. Um, what biodiverse green roofs are about using plants that are functioning for biodiversity. If you want to do an aesthetic green roof, a la, you know, maybe Nigel Dunner, which, you know, is, is fine. That That's about aesthetics. And you'll probably have to do reasonably good irrigation. What Peter's done and what I do is try and use biodiversity to mean that we reduce the amount of um, impact in terms of irrigation. Would you agree there, Peter? Yes. Yes, it's a, it's a long debate now uh, in ecologists, I think, around the world that shall we still chase the, the dream of native uh, plant societies uh, because we messed up so much uh, the habitats all over the world that now the, the, the latest uh, ecologist thinking is talking about rather eco-adequate approach. And we don't aim to, to use a lot of native species on our green roofs at the moment. But to be honest, Julian, we do not have a lot of problem with uh, invasive species. So for instance, kidney vetch, which I, I believe is a is a weed in England, right, Dusty? No, it's not a weed no, in England. Not a weed. No. Okay. I thought it was a weed. But there I, certainly there are species which are invasive weeds in Western Europe and you can buy it in a nursery at a high price in Hungary. Uh, so we don't do not have on our green roofs problems with invasive species at the moment. Um, there's one more question. Uh, Rene, you ask about, uh, so how do we get to the point that this becomes the norm and not just pilot projects? Well, obviously, I would argue in in London, certainly, in the Greater London Authority area, which is the equivalent to Ile de France in, in, in France, is biodiverse green roofs are the norm. Um, now, they're pretty much the norm in, in Switzerland, uh, in the German-speaking parts of Switzerland. Um, and certainly in quite quite a few cities in Germany, like Karlsruhe particularly, um, they're relatively, you know, I wouldn't say they're the norm because they still use a lot of sedum systems uh, in Germany, but they, they are quite prevalent in some cities in Germany. Um, and that's down to policy and planning. Peter, in a way, I think Rene is implying that yours are pilot projects. So you got a response to that? Yes, it's uh, believe or not, we already have a district in Budapest where it's mandatory to to have green roofs, uh, and uh, this is the twelfth district. So whenever you build a new building, you have to put a green roof on it, an extensive green roof. But this is just a sedum green roof. Um, but we are working on it. We are talking about it. That we we now we we explicitly say that. We have a goal that in Budapest and, and in, in the, the large Hungarian cities, we want to have green roofs as mandatory and uh, in a building permission. And, uh, and uh, we also working on uh, guidelines of biodiverse green roofs. So, so, so we, we have this for, uh, I don't know, this, this uh, region 
for the future. But at the moment in Hungary, we have about a, a, a dozen or, or I don't know, 20 biodiverse green roofs. So really, we are talking about pilots. Thank you. Our next webinar topic, um, it's going to be about uh, delivering success for green roofs in Mediterranean and semi-arid climates, where Paolo Bala and Maritza Grasso and Bruce Dobrak are speaking. Um, the, you will find some more um, information online. Uh, Elizabeth, yeah. I, could I quickly just say something? Yeah. Yes. In terms of the uh, arid and Mediterranean training course, what, because, you know, both Peter and I, we know Maurizio, we know Paolo, and I, I know Bruce from Arizona, um, from Texas, is it's what, in a way, if you're from northern climes, it's what you, what we in northern climes can learn from how they do things in southern climes because of climate change, because things are getting hotter in the north, so we have lessons to learn, particularly from from our Italian Italian colleagues who have, have very, very interesting codes of practice. Would you concur, Peter? Yeah, one more, one last question I want to ask um, is um, what topics could be covered in future for EFB webinars? Are there any specific um, topics um, you're interested in? Um, yeah, just um, in case you have some interesting interesting topics just let us know otherwise um yeah because of the time um i would like to say thank you on behalf of the efb